Hello everybody and welcome to Azure Skåne and uh, this presentation about the uh, secrets of the cosmos. And I'm very happy to have uh, our uh, speaker, uh, very thankful that you are coming to visit us, uh, Marilag de Matulak. And um, the agenda for today, it will be uh, first a short welcome and introduction. And then Marilag will uh, tell us about the secrets. And then we take uh, half uh, an hour or break with uh, pizza and um, mingle and uh, chances to, to discuss the any questions. And then finally we wrap up with a Q&A at the end. And Asher Skåne, uh, how many first timers do we have here? Yeah, first time, welcome. And um, Asher Skåne, we are a uh, meetup. We are run by volunteers, so it's completely free to participate at our events. And our goal is for uh, people to learn as much as possible about Azure. It's about networking and um, last but not least, it's about having fun, of course. And everyone is welcome, regardless of your um, skill level on Azure, so it's both for really beginners as well as uh, experts on Azure. And we have been around now since I think 2017 and we have reached over 1000 members. Uh, we had up to uh, around 100 people per meeting uh, before the COVID um, times. Then it was a bit difficult to have these physical meetings and now we are um, uh, yeah, getting back again. So very nice to have you here, welcome. And the crew behind Azure Skåne, that is me, Johan, and uh, I am a consultant working in my own uh, company. I've been working with Azure since around 2009, the first beta version. And um, I've been working with Microsoft technology for about 25 years. And then there is uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, he works for uh, Microsoft now. He was a consultant before, but um, uh, yeah, he's a real Azure guy also. So, um, and then there's Magnus Mortensen, who is um, uh, yeah, really an Azure guy also. Um, he's a Microsoft regional director. And uh, since we have uh, uh, visitors also online, uh, who might come from completely different places in the world, so let's just talk about uh, where we are, Azure Skåne. So if you see this map, you have Sweden here and you have the Swedish flag. And uh, then you can see we are neighbors with Denmark with the Danish flag. And then Skåne, well, we have our own flag, which is a combination of the Swedish flag and the Danish flag. So we have the yellow from Sweden and the red from, from Denmark. Uh, and some things we are famous for here in uh, Skåne uh, it's this building, the, it's called the Turning Torso. And when it was built, I think it was the highest building, the living building in North Europe. Now, I don't know if it is any longer, but it is, it is one of the highest living buildings in, in Europe, at least. And then we have this fantastic bridge. I'm pretty sure you travel over the bridge, my luck to come here. It's very beautiful, you have a beautiful view when traveling there. It's both for uh, trains and for cars. Uh, and uh, if you don't recognize this person, well, this is the, the world's best soccer player, Slata Ibrahimovic, and he's also from this uh, place. And if you like strong drinks, you might have seen this Absolute Vodka. It's also from this region. Uh, now it has been purchased by the French. I think it's Pernod now that owns Absolute Vodka. That's really shame. <laughs> but I hope it's still made in Sweden. And then also we have a very uh, strong uh, gaming, uh, game development industry here in, in this area. So uh, maybe you've heard about massive entertainment. They make the, the game Avatar. Uh, yeah, you see some of the big uh, big sellers on the market. They have been developed here in, in Malmö, in this area. And there are some other um, game development 
development companies as, as well. Um, so this is not just any region. And everything you see here today, well, it says uh, it's the secrets of Cosmos DB, but um, you are free to share uh, whatever uh, we're showing you here. So make sure we are heard. So um, uh, make sure we are seen on uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. That's very nice. And now a very big thank you to Food Cafe. Now Michael, he he's not. He went for the pizzas. Okay, yeah. So, uh, but Food Cafe, uh, big thanks to them because they are one of our great supporters with the venue and the food and the, the drink and everything. Um, and then we also have something which is called uh, digital badgers. And I don't know if you have seen this before, but they are collectibles, and they are. Uh, part of a blockchain, so it's like bitcoins. Uh, they are really, they are rare. You can't, you know, forge them or, or, or create them, them yourself. You have to, um, you can you can earn them at special occasions. Uh, and since you are here, uh, we're watching this live stream. Uh, you uh, will earn one of these badges. So all you need to do is to scan this QR code. You need a, a wallet for that, uh, a blockchain wallet. And we can show you, help you during the break here, how to do that. Um, and if you collect this, you can show that to Microsoft at conference or something, and you can earn something nice uh, back from them. So I can really recommend collecting these uh, badgers. And, and this is one of your few chances to do that. Uh, we also have a Discord channel. And uh, Discord, that is for uh, discussions uh, between our meetings. So there's tons of great and useful info in our Discord. So I can really recommend joining it. And here's an invite link uh, on the screen here and a QR code. So you just need to, to visit uh, this link and uh, join and you will get very helpful information discussions. And this link, it is uh, valid only for about one week. And the same with the Badger uh, QR code. It's only valid for about uh, a week. So if you watch this in, uh, um, in late time, um, it's too late. Uh, I also want to um, announce our next event, which will be about modern cybersecurity strategies. That will be on uh, April 5th. And you can read more about it on our Meetup site, uh, Meetup and Asher Skåne. And with that, I'm finished with the introduction. And welcome on stage, Marilag. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here, finally. It's my first in-person event in two and a half years, I guess. Yeah. So you're my first audience. I think my last in-person event was also in, in Stockholm um, for the Sweet Hug. So I love Sweden. My first time in Sweden was a couple of years ago, and I fell asleep outside the bar <laughs> under the sun. I wasn't drunk. It was just hot. So for the record, I was sitting like in some outdoorsy stuff, and I closed my eyes. And the next thing I know, I was surrounded by people partying. So. That's a bit of an experience. Second time I came here, snow, a lot of snow. <laughs> Nothing like in Denmark, so you don't salt the, the ground, right? So it's pretty thick snow. So I was rushing to my talk for Swedag outside the train station, and I put on the wrong shoes. So the next thing I know, I was lying on the snow <laughs> just before my talk. So today, today is pretty easy. I not that easy because I had to cancel last time. Sorry about that. Circumstances. Um, today I almost didn't get, go through that bridge because I forgot my passport. <laughs> um, silly of me, but uh, they let me go. Just told me uh, next time I should better bring my passport. And yeah, of course. Uh, and also I'm I'm working in Denmark, so I have a work permit in Denmark, which is expiring today. <laughs> So everything is just, you know, go 
working but almost not working so I'm glad to be here thank you thank you for attending so secrets of the cosmos so it's actually um, a confession I have a lot of confession about my experience with cosmos DB um, and my hope is that we can learn from this mistakes that I have made all throughout I think I started working in cosmos DB about six seven years ago only if I do the math right anybody works with cosmos DB okay all of you are working okay <laughs> maybe no because sometimes people are just interested and curious so I don't know maybe you're better than me or maybe we can learn from each other uh, I've been a developer for 20 years um, and my first database was Fox Pro 6 I'm not that old Fox Pro 6 late 90s um, data driven programming language everything is in it I didn't understand what was going on the teacher was saying create foreign keys create relationships like what um, but learn that and actually I was a little bit of a rogue in college so we were supposed to use Fox Pro for thesis but I said I don't want to use that there's something new nice that net SQL server so I did that for my thesis I almost didn't pass well because I didn't use the curriculum but it was fun times what's your um, first database you won <laughs> don't know that <laughs> oh yeah anybody older <laughs> anybody can beat that I think Fox Pro is based on Fox base which is based on D base or something like that um, I still have like my thesis this thick with, with some of the code Fox Pro code but all these years um, working with application and database I thought I'm an expert apparently not so much but I was pretty confident with um, you know designing relationships with entity relationship diagram believe it or not that's an ER diagram <laughs> so I put all the ghosts from Pac-Man because it does look like this maze so I, I love it I thought I was in a safe place with this and if I need to change a field over there I need my ORM <laughs> to to play good with my with the, my, my data model um, you know migration scripts and all that stuff pretty pretty happy with that my life was great with relational database and then one day I moved to Denmark and my life has changed <laughs> so this was me actually at the time when I was still very happy uh, working with relational database and working with servers that I can actually touch it's not on the cloud I brought it you know this was me bringing database servers on a six hour bus ride somewhere remote in the Philippines. And that's me also setting up ODBC connection between my clients and my SQL server. And I think it's the Pope watching over me saying, bless you child. <laughs> um, so that was my life until I moved to the very sunny Copenhagen <laughs> where you get to do a lot of outdoorsy stuff um, over this bridge, beautiful bridge by the way. And so I was doing some outdoorsy stuff one day and I looked up in the cloud and say, my destiny is there. And then it says, you shall become a cloud developer. So I went to my business partner. I own a company, a software development company at that time. We just started and I say, I shall become a cloud developer. My business partner said, brilliant. Let's build something on the cloud. Let's sell projects in the cloud. Let's do it. And that's how my Cosmos DB love story began. That's how I became Cosmos DB developer so I'm here again as I mentioned to do a confession by the way my name is Mariela de Matula and um, I'm an Azure MVP I do a lot of community works for Azure user group Denmark Azure user group Philippines and I also I'm a tech entrepreneur I own my own company called device we're based in Copenhagen and in the Philippines and just wanted to do some shameless plug I'm also one of the co-founders of ULAP.org. It's a non-for-profit organization and we provide uh, pro bono training and certification to some underserved youths who are already studying STEM, but have, because of circumstances, have difficulty going through or breaking through the industry, so we're helping them. Um, would love to talk about that later. So my confessions, the things that I did wrong. I'm so embarrassed because all of you work with Cosmos DB, so you're probably just gonna say, oh, why did you do that? But I'm exposing myself here um, so that 
someone who's probably very new in Cosmos DB will not make the same mistake. My first mistake, no partitioning. Who does that? So maybe you are all aware about partitioning in Cosmos DB. If you have a highly scalable database that can do geo-replication in one click, first thing you have to learn is how to do partitioning to scale your data. And I didn't know that. So our first project, um, we actually we actually built a um, a forms like a forms management or form builder type of application as a, a business risk business contract risk assessment uh, for a large enterprise company in, in Denmark. And the idea is that they have this specialized form builder like Microsoft um, Forms or SurveyMonkey, but they use it to design the questionnaire for building forms that salespeople all over the world in different countries need to fill up um, in order to assess the, if this contract is risky or not. So that was the assignment. Um, so I thought, oh, forms. I can save a template um, with all my questions and all the possible responses. And then that template could be copied throughout different countries with different versions because th the country can then just do their own templates on top of the, the main template for the HQ so they can delete or um, add some questions in their own. But some of the things in the template from HQ is kind of mandatory, so you know there's there's some sort of versioning templating in that, and then of course uh, there's the actual form response, like when the sales uh, people needs to submit the form, they fill it up, they have a UI, etc. So that was the whole application, pretty straightforward um, structure and model. As I mentioned, I have a form template with all the information about the or attributes about the template, and each template you would have a section that's very typical. You have legal section, finance section, et cetera. And then under each section, you would have the questions. And then each of the question, you can design what kind of responses you will have. For example, if you have a response with, with different data type, like if you have a response that's a range of number or options or whatever, everything is configurable. So that was the idea. The data structure for the form itself is also very straightforward. You have a data for the response form. It, of course, you have to know which template you're using. Again, you have the sections, and for all of the um, your responses, that's also stored there. And there's also an approval of the form, so you know the, the the sales managers or the department heads can look at each of the response and say that's good, that's good, that's good, and then you know compute the risk. So why did we choose Cosmo, or why did I choose Cosmos DB at that time? Well, um, if I analyze the read pattern. The structure itself fits very much in a document database, not so much in a relational database. One thing is, for example, if you look at a form template with the sections and the questions, it's very um, you know, one to many. But I don't need different tables and do a join just to load a template. That can easily just be in one document. So that was always the read pattern. I get the tem template or I get the actual filled up form. No need for relational database in there. The update pattern is also the same. So let's say I'm updating the form template. Let's say I updated a question, changed the question title, or changed the responses. Fine, it can trickle down to the other country templates. It can even trickle down to the forms. But I can repeat the data. I can repeat the question name because it will hardly change. Do you know what I mean? The question title will hardly change. If it does change, I'm creating a new version of the template, which will only be applied to the new responses or to the new forms that will be submitted. So that was the story. So that means I can denormalize my data. Um, because if I change the question name, it shouldn't apply to everything that's related to that, relating to that question. Uh, so, so there's the normalization in there. So perfectly fine. And even the event that I really need to change the question and have it trickle down on all the documents, uh, which is rare, let's say a spelling mistake, same version. Then that's the only heavy work that I need to do where I need to update all the copies. Um, very kind of common pattern in NoSQL schema-less uh, database structures. So I choose Cosmos DB and of course with a global distribution um, because they, are, they have different countries involved. So I didn't want to spend time understanding geo-replication. Mistake. 
I didn't do partitioning. <laughs> I didn't know why. I was very new. And then I saw, of course, you need to define partition keys, et cetera. I look at the, at the different um, limits if you're on a single partition, certain number of storage or certain number of transactions it can, um, can, it can accommodate in a second. And I thought, well, I'm not going to reach that. Won't need partition. Wrong. <laughs> Very wrong. Um, but for those maybe in the audience, maybe you guys already understand partitioning, but just for the benefit of the others in the, um, the audience here uh, who needs a little primer with the partitioning. Uh, so in Cosmos, DB, uh, in Cosmos DB, all your data by default has, uh, is, is redundant within the same region. So even if you don't have partitions, you would always have uh, what we would call a per physical partition so every time you do an operation, you write data or you read data on Cosmos DB, it's automatically uh, replicated in about three nodes before it tells you that the transaction is committed. And if you do have um, global distribution, that data will also be replicated in all the regions that you turn on. And it depends on your consistency model. If you're in strong consistency, then it will, or Cosmos DB will only accept that the operation has succeeded after it has um, replicated the data on all the other regions. But if you have eventual consistency, it will say, OK, that's good. But then in the background, it's updating the other regions with your data. And you can, be, you can count on at some point, eventually, your data will be available unless something happens, you know, network problem or whatever, that you might have some data loss. But yeah, but that's the nature of the replica sets in Cosmos DB. And that means that with the concept of physical partitions, you have your nodes here. That means you have physical storage, compute, etc. If you don't partition your data, all your operations will go to the same physical servers, which has limitations. You know, you don't have enough. At some point, you're going to reach the storage. At some point, the CPU is... Um, is going to process a lot of transaction, memory will increase, you will reach a wall if your data um, increases or scales. So why you need partition? Because then if you partition it, uh, your data, then you can be sure that um, if you pass, for example, if you take, in my, in my case, I would have partitioned it by, let's say by country, because I know that the access pattern is always by country, and the country is pretty much, based on my analysis, have the same um, operational pattern. So that means there's, I think maybe UK is probably, in this case, probably the noisiest, but that's going to be even out as well, because Cosmos DB knows how to kind of um, spread out your operations across all these different partitions. So you have your logical partition here. Let's say you have several countries. And then maybe uh, one or more logical partitions will go to one physical partition, and then the others will go on the other partitions. Cosmos DB takes care of that. They, it knows. So yeah, so not having that is was funny for me. So I went to a Microsoft meeting trying to explain. I used Cosmos DB because it was very new. Oh, what partition strategy do you use? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna get back to you that. Okay, but I learned my lesson since then. So yeah, that is me saying don't trust the machines, partition, scale. Mm. So this is what I should have done. I already explained partition by country. What I, but it doesn't always have to be by country. You have to analyze your own patterns, uh, your access patterns, read and write patterns to understand your partition strategy. And of course, you need to do monitoring uh, using the, um, the, the metrics in Cosmos DB, the available metrics, because then there you can see, do I have any hot partition? Do I have a very kind of um, bad country <laughs> that's overusing my, my, uh, my resources? So something like that, then you can hopefully adjust it or re-architect your data model. So second mistake, large document. Oh gosh, this is so embarrassing. I don't even want to go through this, um, but I will. So I talked about all the, the, the form templates responses. A questionnaire can probably have about, I would say, 
70 questions, they really make it hard for the salespeople to go <laughs> through the contract. What this newbie did was to put everything in one document. And how did that, um, how did that look like? Uh, was it this one? Oh, I lost my filter. So I'm just gonna have to copy that. Maybe I'll just take it off. Okay. Maybe it's this one. Here's my result. This is probably easier. Hmm. Copy paste. So this is my form with all the sections and the questions. And it's about 4,000 something lines. Not the way to do it. Um, not the way to do it, right? And another thing is, one thing, if you're, if you're designing your document, let's say you have unbounded arrays of objects, meaning you don't know how many items can, de can it be in that array, then you don't know how large your document will be at some point. So you need to account for that. If you have, so better to separate it. If you have things like, you know, like in this one, somewhere there I need to store the comments of the approver or the comments of the, um, the one submitting. And comments can be string, large string even. That's also gonna increase your document. And you will hit a limit, and then all your queries, all your get, that's gonna be kind of slow. Your hit the latency, our user are gonna increase. So you really need to analyze um, Again, your pattern and your clients, what do they need in the first go? So for example, um, in our case, you have a landing page that's probably just gonna Im show basic information about the forms. You don't need all the data at that point. So maybe you will have one document just containing basic attributes. And then once I click on section on the form, then only load those sections and the questions under that section, which will be in one document and then maybe um, do lazy loading of the responses or load, if I separate each response into its own document, then I can also just stream that. So I will just display this, the, the responses as I receive it from the API. No need to store everything in one document and load in one go because I don't need it at once. Um, so you really have to rethink and you really ha need to kind of merge not only your persistence model, but what is your SLA for your API? And again, what is your uh, use case on your UI? But not only on your UI, you might expose an API that is uh, being used by automation, not a UI, which expects a certain amount of data to get from that API call. Analyze that, and then that's the only time you will know how to structure um, your, your documents and split them if necessary. And in some case with your data model, you can have them in the same container. There is a case for that. Maybe you will also need to put them in separate containers if you had a different access pattern with different partitioning strategy. Let's say in this case, I always read from country, always, always read from country. But at some point, maybe I want to get all responses from a certain section. Um, then you would do a cross partition query in that case because sections will belong, different sections will belong to different countries and this is just not gonna fit. So maybe it's worth considering having another container with a different access pattern um, and it, yeah, it depends on your, on your needs really. But my, my point here is that don't do it like me, just, oh, I have a document and can store every data, four dots and lines. <laughs> what were you thinking? So, large document. Expensive queries. I also made the classic mistake. Um, and I think it's also because, you know, when you're coming from a, a, a 
like a SQL Server world or any other relational database world where you're very used to SQL statements already doing one way and then you come across uh, a new platform and then say, oh, they also support SQL statements. I'm just gonna write my SQL statements the same way I've always had. Guilty? <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one, but I did that. So my select statements, um, uh, I, ju I just use, this is very, very standard. Select asterisk from, you know, where, from, from C where CID is equals to the ID of the document. First of all, you don't want um, the star <laughs> if you don't need it. That's going to increase again your RU. But some developers they just say, "Oh, I just, I just, I'm lazy. I just do select asterisk," and then again with the ID. But you can do it much better with your SDK if you know point reads. That's uh, less expensive. So this one is a SDK for .NET. So you have the read item async where you have to pass the ID and their partition key. And just to illustrate the difference between that, so if you do point read, you can guarantee for a one kilobyte uh, document, you can guarantee less than 10 MS, which is the normal Cosmos DB SLA. But if you just do a simple query, if you use the query iterator, item query iterator, and run this statement, then you just don't know um, how much, what would be the latency because the query engine decides because it's still running the query instead of doing um, uh, key value pair lookup against the data itself, which point reads does. Uh, same, higher are you with a query? And another thing is that of course with the point read you get one item. If you do just a query, even though you filter by ID, you will still get a collection, you still need to iterate. That's again, processing. Uh, and then with the point read mandatory for the um, for the partition uh, partition key, but for the query, if it's query, of course it's never mandatory to pass a partition key when execute the query. You have to, <laughs> at least for this one. So it's recommended. But if a developer just forget and say select asterisk from this with ID, then that can be very expensive. Depends on how large your data is. Another one is the join. We're so used to writing joins in SQL. Uh, so the first time I encountered joins in a document-based uh, database and in Cosmos DB, I was like, I can't do join across documents. I can't do joins from another container. What? So the, I, was, I was young. Um, so that was the, 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 the idea. So you really have to get used to the new structure that you can only join within the single document this would work uh, but I, I I don't know I always get confused with the way with the join P uh, which is the alias in and then your kind of sub array there in the document I find myself just googling it all the time because I'm so used to the joins in SQL much more efficient perhaps is doing sub queries where instead of doing the join here you can first do your uh, filtering and then so, so the query engine will execute this first and then do your join. That can be, this will be more optimized way. will produce the same result. And sometimes you probably don't even have to do the join. You can do exists. If you're looking at something, you're only displaying a record or uh, an item, a root attribute, where you want to filter by some value within your array, like an object. You can just do exists in that array. So, so select this from this array and then if it exists, uh, if you, that's, that can work. If you don't need, in your select clause, you don't need any attribute within that array and you only need the attribute under, uh, like your root attributes. Uh, but if you need something from there, let's say it's an array of responses and you need like one of the attributes in that responses, then you have to use join. So yeah, paging. Um, Again, I mentioned that before we were loading all the active forms on the landing page, and we were just say, just load everything. Let the client let the client page it. Anybody has done that before? Like I don't want to bother uh, thinking how to do paging behind the scenes. So uh, my browser is very powerful. I'm just going to do paging there. Uh, so you have a very easy way to do paging in Cosmos DB using the SDK as well, and just very very simple. Um, 
demo here for the sample code. By the way, you can find all the sample code in GitHub. Cosmos DB has uh, done a very good job to tell you already how to how to do things so you don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, using the SDK. So uh, first thing is, um, so again, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, code here because you probably know this already if you work with .NET, .NET developers or, OK. So um, you have the get item query iterator, and then you only have to check if there are more results and do a while loop. And the SDK will do the paging for you. If you don't set the max item count, the SDK will also figure out um, how many items it will return in a page. And in this case, if you don't have a very large data set, by default, uh, you have a cap of 4 MB, I guess. So if it exceeds 4 MB, it will page it. But if not, it will just put it in the same page. That's the same with the um, seconds with the latency. So if you have a very complex query that exists, let's say, five seconds, that's going to return something. So you can it's predictable. You can expect it from the SDK. And if your client, of course, uh, just can handle a, a lot of items, let's say you have you know tens of thousands of rows, and you don't want Cosmos DB to determine how many items it will return per page, then, of course, you can change the max item count. And so something that uh, you also need to, to think about. Sometimes there's also an implication on your R use with the way you page, because the smaller the page size, of course, the lesser the R use. So if you're in a tight budget and you kind of want to throttle your R usage, then page your, um, page your queries. It can be slower, but then you will save a little bit on the R use. Good. So another lesson, indexing. I'm not going to go very deep in indexing. That's another topic. There's lots of resources about indexing. But the lesson I've learned is that letting this, I, I got kind of hooked with the auto indexing. Ooh, auto indexing. I don't have to do anything. I'm so lazy. Um, wrong. <laughs> it's default. By, by default, very expensive. It's helpful if you have a very small document with very few properties where you probably most likely will have to use each of those properties in your query then in the auto indexing would be a good candidate. But if you have a lot of properties and you only use maybe two, three of them for your queries, please um, tune your indexing policy. You can set up you know, what's excluded and what's included. And there's even a way for you to analyze now. I think uh, this has been released some time ago that you can turn on populate index metrics. So you will have. Um, in the metrics, you can you can see for your call for your query, what is kind of a, what is the impact of your query on the index. So it can show you which index path has high impact or low impact, and it will even give you an indication or a recommendation how to um, optimize your index. Maybe you need some uh, what do you call that, like a compound index if you're querying on two properties. So better make a Compound index. So, so th this will just tell you. It's not something you can really learn upfront. So, having metrics uh, would be very helpful. So, expensive queries, point reads. Look at your joins. Uh, make very efficient subqueries, and very important, yeah, your indexing policy. All right. <laughs> I still have more mistakes. I'm not done yet. We're halfway there. Um, conflict in rights. Okay. So concurrency, um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not, depends on your use case. In our use case, we have, as I mentioned, we have the approval. And actually, in the approval, you can assign several approvers for the same form, but only one can approve. So let's say I have Henrik and Anna assigned as the approver of the form. Henrik, uh, he's in Copenhagen. He retrieved the form on the UI. He looked out the window, who oh, son? I'm just going to step out for a bit. I'm going to go out <laughs> and bask in the sun. And then eight hours later, he decided something else. So he was that, and did the same with Anna. Anna doesn't like the sun so much. So after Henrik has retrieved the form, she, retrieved the, she clicked the same email, got the form, and quickly approved. And that gets saved to the form, uh, to the database form, form database. 
So by the time Henrik say reject, conflict. But if you did not handle optimistic concurrency in your code or anywhere else, the Cosmos DB would just do uh, last write reads. So this is something that um, I needed to take care of. So very easy in the SDK, again, with Cosmos DB. Remember your e tags. We, I, I did actually manual e tags before. I retrieve it, check the e tags if it's equal, and then if it's not, throw some error or something like that. Apparently, of course, you can use the uh, SDK. There's an option for your request. You can say if match e tag equals e tag. Then, um, so when you retrieve the item, let's say Henrik retrieved the item, I can take the e tag for that uh, version of the document. And if it doesn't equate by the time that I execute absurd, the SDK will throw an error. And I can just handle that and tell Henrik, don't go out to the sun when you need to approve a form. All right. Um, the next thing is uh, transactions. Another thing that can be complex depending on the use case. In our use case, remember with uh, the form that you have a section and what they wanted was, so there are different ways, right? So they say, they either say the whole form, you need to fill up the whole form with all the sections before we submit it. Or they, another requirement could be, let's make it asynchronous every time you change the response, it saves on the database, fine. But in this case, the requirement was, I need to work on the same section, write my comments, write my responses, et cetera, and I see submit just one section at a time. And if I switch section, then that section will be saved as a whole. So different requirements, right? So with that requirement, how do you implement or wh what do you do with the transactions? In this case, um, well, my mistake was just doing a for each and then saving all the responses per section without really thinking, what if one of the responses fail? What am I gonna do? Should I just tell the users, sorry, one out of 10, only one out of your 10 responses succeeded? then you would have a very frustrated user. So this we did in transaction. Again, you have the SDK to do that. You have the tr transactional batch. Batch You can do um, the Fluent SDK to group all your operations in one batch, and that supports creating and also deleting both for um, yeah, objects or strings. And then you can execute it in one batch, and you can handle if uh, if, if something wrong occurs. So again, learn my lessons. Really look into um, how you will efficiently use transactions and really handle optimistic concurrency. Are we okay so far? Are, are you judging me now? <laughs> um, uh, so another thing, unexpected request bursts. Oh, this happens. Even with this very simple project that I did, everything looked okay, it works, put it in production. And then we have one, I mentioned earlier that we have one scenario where the headquarter will change the question, which will ultimately create a new version. And that version will be propagated to all the countries. So it will essentially, um, in parallel, create ver new versions across all countries with that very large document, 4,000 lines. Uh, and of course, it's not a very um, expensive project, so the RUs are quite limited. So the first time it happened, somebody changed the, uh, the form, and then everything went haywire. Like, no, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that. So everything was failing. And of course, we're reaching RUs, we're getting throttled. Uh, yeah, so hard lesson to learn. What did I do at that time? There, at that time, there's no serverless option. There's no auto scale. Do it on your own. So again, for those who are probably new with Cosmos DB, the, the concept of request units, what affects it. Of course, it depends on how complex your read is. What are you writing? How large is your document? That's the size. Indexing, again, if you do auto indexing, more expensive are used because essentially the operation requires that everything in this property will be written in the storage that backs up your index. Expensive. And if you have GU distribution, that's also more expensive. And depending on your consistency model, uh, strong I think is also more expensive. So cheap for the eventual consistency. So all these things you need to, to understand. What I did back then was manual. So because we know 
what particular operation would require uh, a higher RU, then you can just adjust it for that particular call. That's what we did. Of course, we have to sacrifice. We have to pay one for one hour, even if it just took, what, five minutes to complete. But that's fine. That's still much more saving for us. So if you have a bit more relaxed SLA and you know your peak time, it's OK to do it manually. You can do auto scale uh, if you have unpredictable workload. But then again, with auto scale, you still have a cap. That means you still need to analyze what would be your maximum RUs at a given point. For me, personally, that's hard to compute. But if with the metrics, you would come and see that over time that, oh, maybe I need, on average, I need 10,000 RUs or 50,000 RUs. But you have to know because you need to put a cap. Otherwise, um, yeah, you'll end up paying a lot. <laughs> so <clears throat> you can do schedule. If it's not on trigger, you can have some other functions that increase your RUs. Uh, if you know when you need to do that or you opt for the serverless, which is, you know, you pay for what you use. Uh, there's a lot, um, yeah, effect with the pricing and cost reduction for just optimizing. Sometimes just turning on serverless would be good. Another thing with the 429, I want to mention that it's, I'm not always scared with 429s. If I look at the application inside and I see I got throttled, sometimes it's also fine because, um, it will retry, the SDK will do automatic retry. And if you don't observe any degradation in your service, then you're probably on the sweet spot. Otherwise, if you don't see any throttling at all, in my view, you're probably overpaying or over-provisioning because there's so much. So if you have pretty straight usage, I think, it depends. Again, depends on how relaxed your SLA is. So if you don't want latency at all or users experiencing something like try again every now and then, um, then, then by all means uh, increase your, your RUs. And in our case, it's an internal application. It's not customer facing. It's fine. They can live with it. So yeah, lessons I've learned. Another lesson, uh, we're getting close <laughs> with all my mistake. Um, evolving schema. It's something that was also very new to me when I started working with uh, schema-less databases, right? So are you guys um, pros in NoSQL schema-less? So, so one of the few things that kind of um, I thought was challenging is even though it's schema-less and it, it can accept any shape of your data model, at some point, you would still need to evolve your data model. You will add a field. You will remove a field. You will change the, proper, the, the type of that field. And your code needs to be both backward compatible or forward compatible even. So there are some things that you need to do. And you need to make some you know, decisions like, do, what do I want to do with the existing data that's on the database that doesn't have that field yet when I start saving the new ones? Let's say I add a field tag in the form. So what, what, how would I treat if I do a query and then I get a bunch of data and some of them have tags and some of them don't have tags. If I don't handle that in my code, I'm going to fail. Uh, and that's the same with, um, you know, like, so that's when you remove and what if I, uh, I added something and, you know, so, so really important to, to, to decide up front, do I migrate my existing data so they're uniform still, even if they're schemaless because my code requires it? Do I want to run a migration to update, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of documents just to add the tag property or not? So these are some of the things. So, so another thing that we can do with, uh, with, with Cosmos DB is to use some of these type checking functions. Uh, for example, this is defined or is null. This is something we use a lot uh, when we know that maybe we need to handle that this property is not existing anymore. And so we use is defined for the property, and that will return uh, true or false if it's not there. And if it's null, of course, if it's the value is null. Major difference, uh, is null needs to be explicit. So the property is there, but the value is null. So that means um, that, how do I say this? Like, if you remove it, if you remove it, 
then if you, if you remove it from your POCO, and then the next document will not have that property, so is defined will work. Otherwise, if you have an, um, if you have an old code that has that property, but you're, you stop using that property, but it's still in your class definition, every time you create a new document, if your code did not account for that, that field that is not being used anymore, but was not removed in your class definition, we'll always have null. It's much more expensive to check if it's null, of course, because it's still there. It's not empty. It's just null. And, but so better to, to understand uh, what, we, what your need is. And another thing with migrating your data, if you have large data sets. So how, how do you guys do it? Like if you need to update hundreds of thousands to migrate it to the new structure. I did, uh, well, we do, uh, we just write custom tool, like um, a command line tool very easy to navigate with the SDK. Uh, we use the bulk API as well. And that's another thing that you can use. The bulk API with the SDK will allow you to do um, big changes on your large data set more efficiently. It takes advantage of parallelization on your machine and all that. Uh, or you can, of course, write your stored procedures that you can run. So, but. Um, my lesson, or what I was thinking is, you need to think about this upfront, because I still experience it in our, in, in our project. Uh, it's a different project now for uh, another enterprise company. You know, every sprint, there's just always something new. Ah, oh, the customer wanted another field in the approval flow, et cetera. What do we do with all the other documents? So in, in, in the relational database, um, Again, of course, you have the migration skips and all that, but can be still complicated. So you're not free from the complication of migration. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Number seven, anybody can guess what I did wrong in goodbye data? Well, not me particularly. Well, a little bit me being the architect of that solution, but someone else did something. On production, Sunday evening, <laughs> deployed something that deleted something. Ouch. It's fine if you have told us in time. Um, but what happens is that uh, there's no communication. The developer tried to fix it right away. Took some hours, but fixed it. Deployed a hot fix. Problem fixed. Not happening anymore. Not deleting any data anymore. But then we needed to restore. And then, of course, in Cosmos DB, if you have the periodic backup, then um, in, in the periodic backup, you have at least a minimum of one hour frequency for periodic backup, but by default, it's set to four hours. And then by default, also eight hour retention. So guess what happens if it was Sunday and only uh, mentioned that in the chat, oh, by the way, I deleted something. <laughs> uh, um, so it's more than eight hours. So we called, and, and you know, if you have periodic backup, you have to call the support and say, can you please restore my data? No can do, it's more than eight hours. So uh, hard lesson. The, so I went in right away and changed my periodic. I still went for the periodic. Increased the retention based on what's my um, RPO and my RTO. And also, I didn't, need to, I didn't need to decrease the frequency. That wasn't the case, but just increase the retention. So I had more copies. And at the same time, you can do uh, continuous backup and where you can restore at any point in time, but bear in mind that you still only have 30 days. You have other options with the backup, with, with the actual storage, just to make sure if it's critical business that do you want to copy the, you, do you want a G-redundant storage? Cosmos TV will do that for you, of course, at the price. So backup. Anybody did the same? <laughs> Hope not. So I uh, should have. Again, really um, make a plan at least for your RPO and your RTO. And do test your disaster recovery. I think that's one thing that we always miss. We just really never try to do disaster recovery. Even with the auto, um, what do you call this? It's like when the whole region fails, failover, auto failover. You also have that in Cosmos DB. Like if one whole region fails, that it will fail over to the next region if you do geo uh, replication to at least one region um, should at least test this once and also uh, again depends on 
you know, if you have multi-right regions, what happens if that first right region fails, how, how the data or the transactions will be right, uh, rerouted. So it depends on how advanced your application. These are the, some of the important things that we really need to consider. I think I'm actually going to my last lesson learned. It's pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> I practice this with one hour, but then we have time to do discussion. So the last lesson um, I learned is to abandon planet, abandon planet cosmos. I'm not saying that I'm not using cosmos anymore, but I just came to realize, you know, with my initial excitement, with something that I really want to use, want to learn, really started coding, making things work, fantastic. I, I really love it. And then I try to fit that in almost every scenario that I can think of. But sometimes it just won't do the trick, especially when your, um, your model, like your relations become more complex. As I mentioned, with the one-to-many relationship, it's pretty easy to put everything in one document. But have you ever experienced where you really feel like, I don't want to copy the same data in the same document because I'm so used to, let's say, I have a list of categories. And then you know that category has its own property. I don't want to store the category name in my doc document. It has to be somewhere else. You know, then you have many-to-many -many relationships all of a sudden. Uh, and, and, in that, and, and when it gets even more complex than that, you have multiple entities, you have microservices that has their own entities working together, and then you want it to traverse the relationship. Let's say in, in a social media application where you, you wanted to see who's the friend, a friend, a friend, a friend. These kind of relationships, just for me, doesn't fit very well in just a document database. And so one, other, one thing that you can consider is, of course, maybe for that scenario, you needed a graph. And that's one thing that I really like about Cosmos DB when I pick it because, or when I chose it, because it's, it's, it's by default a little bit polyglot um, persistence. I can do graph as well with the Gremlin API. I don't have to learn uh, a different platform again. I don't have to learn how to do scaling again or my interface, my SDK. So whether I want a normal document database or the graph, I, I still have the same experience. So I, we did consider, so there are times when we say, okay, we're not, we're dropping um, SQL API, we're just doing Gremlin. Another one scenario, for example, is um, permissions. When you have, you know, different resources and you have access controls, roles assignment on each of the resource, it's a nice, a good example for doing it as a graph, but I have one customer where I say, well, I, we needed a graph for this. Let's do Gremlin. Oh, we don't know that. We don't, it's very new to us. Just stick to the document. So I had to define, you can, of course, define this relationship in document uh, databases, but then it's just more, what do you call that? You know, you feel icky when you write the queries. <laughs> Sorry, feels wrong. Even in a even in a relational database that you're trying to fit in a graph using and then querying it using some kind of advanced recursion to get the child of a child of a child, it was just not meant for this. Uh, but of course, you're constrained by your customer, and the best thing to do is really to illustrate, make a POC and see here. Um, it's going to save you down the line, but it's hard when they make the decisions and you know, they choose the platform. So again, I, I learned the hard way that now after two years implementing that, that permission logic with, I mean, in a document database, the, the calls, the queries were just simply expensive. So if I need to find, if you have access to this resource because you have access to the parent, which is seven layers deep, then your queries become expensive in this type of document database, which would have been maybe cheaper in graph. Um, another scenario I would say um, is, is, is data portability. Of course, it's a big topic. I want to be cloud agnostic, and, and now I'm tying myself in a, in a vendor. But I mean, in my book, with the portability, data is probably the easiest thing that can be portable. 
at least persisted data. Uh, if you do your homework well with your application code and then remove all the concerns about the infrastructure behind your classes or use some repository pattern where you can just change the, 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 the infrastructure, the database infrastructure that you're connecting to, I think data should be portable. And here, of course, you can do migration. If you have saved your data in Cosmos DB, there's just JSON documents. You can always put that somewhere else uh, later on. And, and that's also maybe another thing that's worth considering. If you really also want your application code to be portable, let's say another thing, if you chose Cosmos DB, let's maybe choose MongoDB API, because then maybe you have a little bit, if you're really going for the agnostic, you have a little bit more option to maybe migrate it later on to a different instance of MongoDB or in a different cloud or, or something like that. So things to consider. Um, what else with the portability? Mm, with, with my stored procedures, of course, you would have to rewrite that at some point. Uh, but then again, it's in JavaScript. I don't know how much you can. No, you can't use it somewhere else because that's an SDK specific. But then these are the things, as, as long as you design your application that your data, it, the actual structure of your data is portable, then I think you should be good in choosing this. You don't, you don't want to have that argument. I hate when people just say, oh, I don't want to use Cosmos DB because I'm going to be tied out to Azure. Well, th that's not necessarily the case. Um, yeah. What else? Okay, I, have, I didn't put it here. Another argument I've had with a teammate, okay. This is, I actually asked this to the Cosmos DB product team. We were building an application, or we are building an application that requires uh, two-dimensional uh, time. So a bitemporal database where we need to query the database uh, based on value time and transaction time. And it has to be very efficient with that way because we want to move back and forth time. So we want to see, okay, get me this data that was actually transacted last week but only made valid this week so there are some cases where it's like that if you're building something legal financial in our case academic so we need to do this time um, queries and I asked the product team can we feed Cosmos with bitemporal and then um, no you would have to do it your own you would have to save copies of each of this uh, dimension as a separate document. Oh, okay, then that's gonna be quite expensive. So in that case, we actually opted for XTDB. So it's by temporal, but then um, by default, designed by temporal, and it's also event-driven, which means that it's not prescriptive with its storage and the events, the transactions are saved in Kafka, and then the data can actually be saved in any other persistence. Uh, for example, we did something that saves the data in Azure storage. You can pretty much configure it so it saves the data in Cosmos if you want it that way. Um, but why would you? So, but, but these are the things where you need to say, okay, I just need to abandon the planet for now. Um, it's okay. And been a lot of discussions around with this. Uh, there's also another one in, the, in my, well, they did not abandon. This is the, the the one where they just say I want to abandon it without real good reason. That also happens in enterprise. So the project that I'm working for right now is for, um, it's for a really big enterprise company and it's a portal for developers uh, because they want to be a technology company even if they are a shipping company. So they have like 5,000 or so developers building digital products. So we get a lot of insight on how they use the platform, how they use Azure actually. And we get a lot of conversation, even in my own team, where people just say, let's not use Cosmos DB because it's expensive. Well, you heard that. You heard that in one, uh, you know, one YouTube talk. Or, you know, it's fine if it really cost you a lot because you, have, did, you, didn't do, uh, you did all the mistakes that I did. It's fine to say that, but don't come and just say it just because you heard it somewhere that it's expensive. In fact, I was also doing a research back then with comparing the pricing of our use with the pricing of transactions in um, what they call that in DynamoDB in AWS. So it's you know it's the same, if not cheaper, at that time for that use case. 
Um, so don't abandon the planet just because you heard someone else say, this is not the way to go. Unless, of course, it's the big shots making some governance decision, which in this case, uh, it is. But the thing is, lessons learned is, database is ubiquitous in all our application. And it's like, even though you have 20 years, 30 years experience in it, um, every scenario is, is different. And, and you just really need to do your homework to, to, to fine tune your queries, to fine tune your um, operations, look at your, you know, the way you do backup and replication and all that. My penance for all the scenes that I have committed is this. <laughs> I have to travel the seven seas, go through that bridge and to preach <laughs> what I did wrong. This is probably not gonna la be the last for 2022. So I'm gonna go out and, you know, Maybe I will make more mistakes, so this deck is going to be m one hour because right now it's only 50 minutes. Um, so, but, but, but that's my penance. And also to promote that there is a certification, if you're not aware, for Cosmos DB. It's pretty new, released March 11. Um, so before, I think Cosmos DB was part of the Azure Developer Track 204, but now they have their own. Uh, you can, you have a lot of resources. I am actually part of this a certification study hall wherein we go through all the MS Learn uh, modules for Cosmos TV together with other MVPs and the product team live so you can ask questions and it's a bit more interactive. So, you know, looking at MS Learn modules is very nice and fun on your own time. You can do exercises, but sometimes if you're sitting by yourself and you're like Henrik and you saw the sun, then you just abandon the learn. So uh, this one is a bit more um, important. So check that out. Another thing is, I have anyone read this book before? I really like this book. Uh, gives me a lot of insight on how data intensive application works. Teach me a lot about you know the intricacies of partitioning, sharding, data modeling, and then there's a lot of talk about how you know with the consistencies, asset operations. Um, in, in different databases, different data formats. I learned a lot from this book, so I highly recommend that one. Um, yeah. My life is great <laughs> with cloud databases, and I hope yours will be too in the future, not making the same mistakes I did. Thank you so much, and I uh, really enjoyed this first um, live talk in years. Uh, Thank you. For a really great presentation, and we are now about um, yeah seven minutes ahead of uh, schedule, so we are still waiting for the pizza. So I think maybe if we have any questions from the audience, it's a great time right now. So anyone? <laughs> yes, I have a question about the backup. You said that <laughs> you had to put in a request for the backup. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was before continuous backup was enabled. Yeah. Did you enable it afterwards? Mm, not for this one. Because you have to recreate the <laughs> database. Yeah. But now there's a way to enable it afterwards, is there? Mm, not sure, actually. E okay, yeah. No, the reason because I'm asking you have is to you to do it on creation of the container, right? Yeah, the, yes, but there was th they actually made a migration on the back end. Okay. <laughs> If you haven't done it, I had a question about the process there because oh, yeah, there was I haven't something done more. that no. yet. Okay. okay. Uh, one one point there is that I the service continuously gets better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, is there any of those lessons uh, that you learned now that has been eradicated because the service is better? Um, I think I think for me, it's just the whole auto scale serverless was a game changer. Uh, if you start with back in the days when it was still called document DB, where people were really just struggling computing, you know, the RUs. So introducing this auto scale uh, made it much easier for a lot of the use cases. So, so that is one thing that was, uh, for me, was a big improvement. Uh, yeah, the indexing with the metrics, that's also very nice to have a really good view of how the query engine uh, analyzes your query workload.
gives you an opportunity, better opportunity to find really fine tune your indices. Uh, a follow up question? <laughs> Monitoring mm -hmm. on uh, health, performance, or your utilization, 429 errors. Uh, was there a, like a threshold getting that trimmed well? I'm not sure I understand threshold. So no, I'm asking because of uh, uh, some experience yeah. with that. That it was really, um, it wasn't straightforward getting the monitoring right. So you actually monitored the behavior or the health of the Cosmos DB queries and so on. Mm -hmm. um, is there any experiences you can share there? That, that mm. um, again, w one thing is, um, you know, it, for every operation you get the, the R use that was consumed for that particular operation. And then if you do your own kind of analysis on that or logging on that, then you're probably not that um, heavily dependent on what they show on the portal. It, it's more when it gets started to throttle. Oh, the when it started to throttle on my end. How deep can I go? Uh, um, for me, it's a bit of a detective work, to be honest. Um, so I compare it in with, I can, so I start seeing the throttling. From application insights, I saw exactly what was being called by the application. And then I deduce just the fact that, ah, okay, for this particular, let's say, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have, again, permissions, right? So uh, we cache the permission data. So it's saved in Cosmos DB, but, and then it's, again, queries actually Azure AD to see roles assignment, et cetera, or group assignment, then take some other metadata in Cosmos DB, combine that together, cache the result for all your access against all, all over the application on the application layer. But that actually, of course, expires. So at some point, you would have to query it again. Uh, so we were seeing a lot of weird errors on the front end, something that's happening. And then looking at the application insights, drilling down, oh, this is the call to the permission and the kind of refreshing the cache. And then that's when I do four to nines because I can see that for this particular time period, I, I, I live inside application inside, that for this particular time span, several users were all uh, starting at once or actually there was an automation, there was a service principal that's doing massive work and then refreshing its own um, uh, permissions from the database. So I can see that I reach and then I computed how much our use it takes to do this operation, multiply it by the time in that certain small space, okay, then I, I can see I reached the RU. But that's the, for me at least, my experience is um, detective work inside application insights. Otherwise, if you just look at the metrics and see, there's not much there. Yeah, so during development, that was impossible to foresee. Unless you emulate some of these scenarios to test, you do load testing and then and see, okay, I know that an automation will run at this point in time. This service principal is probably gonna rehydrate the cache for getting its permission set. Oh, I'm just gonna try that. And then you will be able to test. Uh, but yeah, so it, it, it's load testing on dev would give you something. Alerts on the production. Maybe you could do alert if you can see that, well, not maybe on the RU level, but the number of transactions which you know will cost this much RU. And if you're exceeding the number of requests, then you should get an alert because then you might know that soon you will be throttled, something like that. Thank you. <laughs> so any more questions? Yes. So, uh, uh, bulk insert. So you you're using. Uh, I'm 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 pretty new to Cosmos DB, but uh, you're using some kind of SDK for bulk insert. Mm -hmm. But I know that in newer version of of SDKs there are uh, bulk insert or uh, bulk support included in the SDKs. Uh, do you have any recommendations on 
So the, this, there's this a uh, bulk executor in the yeah. SDK, yeah. Yeah. Um, in in which particular scenario? Uh, we have uh, one one database. We we pull pull uh, um, data from an a SQL server into a uh, Cosmos DB, mm -hmm. uh, and we do that uh, like uh, one once once uh, every night. Mm. So uh, we have a little bit problems with, with it. Uh, sometimes it stops <laughs> with okay. in the middle, and uh, and uh, I want to know uh, how I can improve the the uh, reliability of the import that we do. Using the the uh, but you're already using the bulk executor, or you're uh, just running some. I at the moment I'm using uh, the the bulk support that is in uh, the the regular SDK. Mm -hmm. the newer versions of the SDK. So I don't use the bulk executor. Okay. Mm. Is that a, a good idea? Is that something I should do instead? Uh, that's at least what we are using. Mm -hmm. um, and and if it stops, I what what is it running? Where is it running? The, I mean, the, the importer. It's in an API project, so it's <laughs> not very... Okay. Maybe we should have uh, made this in, in the data factory or, or something instead. Yeah, you could uh, export it and then import it directly. Mm -hmm. You you can make some data pipelines uh, behind the scenes, so export yeah. in a certain data format and then mm -hmm. import it directly into Cosmos DB instead yeah. of using the yeah. SDK. That can also be mm. um, one way. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's mm, that's me. I think. <laughs> Sometimes it will stop. Um, uh, what could be? Sometimes it would do. Of course, you have some parallelization there. Maybe you need you, you're you're reaching um, max uh, um, max concurrency where your uh, API is running on, and if you don't adjust the parallelism, then it will start using all the threads, and then at some point you won't be able to execute more transactions because you have exhausted the the, the pool, the connection between the API and the database. So that's one thing maybe you can look at. Um, I don't know if you're hitting any our use uh, consumption that uh, would We have it on, on auto scale as it is. Okay. So and we had, uh, even then we had some problems, but uh, I sorted that out with uh, introducing uh, like uh, a sleep. So uh, if we, so we, I, I tuned uh, the sleep until we didn't get any losses, <laughs> right. but otherwise uh, it's really hard to like uh, dump like uh, a, a lot of data into the Cosmos DB. Uh, um, yeah, so but yeah, but I, I, I'm a little bit newbie on this. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, but, but in our case, at least it was um, the bulk API. But then we have to fine tune the parallelization to make sure that a lot of the processes are limited and yeah can support what, what okay, so parallelization okay yeah mm. oh there's pizza mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you thank you